All right, so we're still on our journey at the cellular level. We've talked about all of the cell organelles and how the cells are structured and plasma membrane and how it functions. Now we're going to take a look at energy, the different types of energy, how cells harvest energy and use energy, and also in a working cell, how enzymes work to help cell function. We're going to start this lecture off by talking about energy and the different types, but before we get there, let's uh, have some kind of random facts about energy. So, did you know that 10 million, 10 million ATP molecules are needed per second to power just one active muscle cell? That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> Or did you know that you must run 14 miles to burn the calories in a pepperoni pizza? That sucks. Or how about 75% of the energy generated by a car engine is lost as heat? If we could only harness a bit more, we'd have awesome MPG. All right, so let's take a look at this concept of energy. So what is this thing called energy? Well, energy is the capacity to do work. So it is um, performed when objects move against opposing forces. And there's different kinds of energy. We can have kinetic energy, which is the energy of something that's in motion. We can also have potential energy, which is the energy that's kind of stored in an object um, at a specific location or arrangement. So we can say like, you know, the book on the highest shelf has a lot of potential energy because, you know, if it falls, there's going to be a lot of uh, energy kind of released in that sense. So we've um, studied, or at least in chemistry, you've studied the conservation of matter and other conservation um, laws. Well, the conservation of energy says that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only changed from one form to another. So energy is um, nothing that you can create or destroy. You're just going to change it from one to another. So from potential energy to kinetic energy or from chemical energy to heat energy. When we talk about energy, we also usually talk about a concept called entropy, which is the measure of disorder or randomness. So heat energy is... Um, the energy kind of in the with the most entropy it's the most random form of energy because it's the energy of molecules moving aimlessly around okay so if we've got um, low heat that means there's very little energy in the molecules and they're moving very slowly if it's high heat there's lots of random energy in those molecules and they're moving very fast so one way that we can you know measure energy is to kind of measure heat, okay? It's the transfer of energy and the, the random molecular motion of molecules. The type of energy that we're going to focus on in the biological world is chemical energy, which is a form of energy. In fact, it's a form of potential energy um, that's present in food and gasoline and other fuels that, um, you know, things use in order to run in order to you know survive and go it arises from the arrangement of atoms and molecules and in particular we're going to talk about um, the arrangement of of atoms and molecules in the fats carbohydrates um, that you know living animals eat but we can also relate it to the arrangement of atoms and molecules in like gasoline which cars use as well the chemical, that energy that's stored in the bonds between those atoms is what we call chemical energy. Now the reason why we bring up gasoline in cars is because living cells and car engines have something in common. They basically use the same process to make stored chemical energy available for work. What they do, both cells and cars, is they have to break down the organic fuel so the cells have to break down the you know carbohydrates and fats and stuff like that. And the cars have to break down the uh, you know, the gasoline fuel in order to release energy. So when we break bonds 
energy is released. And that energy is called chemical energy. In a car, we use uh, heat to break the bonds inside the combustion engine, and that uh, produces the kinetic energy of the movement of the wheels. Um, in contrast, in the cell, we have to the, the cell has to go through cellu cellular respiration or breaking down of uh, glucose molecules in order to release energy and harness it in the energy um, molecule called ATP. And that's the molecule that will allow all the rest of the cell to do its work. The parallel between cars and cells keeps on going because both of them have to use oxygen in order to break the bonds to harness energy. So in a car, oxygen mixes with the gasoline in the car engine. Uh, along with heat, we get combustion. Bam, waste products of a car are carbon dioxide and water. Now water obviously in the vapor form coming out of your exhaust. We don't usually, you know, drip water out of cars um, unless it's actually cold outside, which you might see will happen. In any case, um, cells just like cars have to use oxygen in order to harvest that chemical energy in food. That's why our bodies, guess what, breathe in. Yes, oxygen. We use that oxygen on a cellular level to um, break bonds in order to harvest that chemical energy found in food. And just like cars, the waste products of cellular respiration are carbon dioxide and water. So that's why our bodies breathe out carbon dioxide. So um, like I said, this, this uh, respiration or sorry, this process is called cellular respiration. And we'll learn all about that in the next lecture. But to give you a little heads up, cellular respiration is basically the process in which the cell breaks down the food molecules to release energy, and it stores it in a form that the cell can use to do work. Um, cellular respiration is performed in the mitochondria, and just like cars, again, we're back to cars, just like cars, it's not that efficient. Um, in fact, 40% of our food energy is, can be converted to, you know, to actually to do cellular work. The other 60%, you guessed it, is converted to heat. So we're a little more efficient than cars, um, but it's still not quite efficient. All right, so our bodies get the fuel that we need to produce energy from the food that we eat. And if you look on the back of any food item, you'll see the nutrition label, and it'll tell you the calories, okay, the calorie count in that particular food. Now, a calorie is basically a unit of energy. It's, how, it's one way we can measure um, energy. In fact, in the chemistry lab, a calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. So, um, there you go. On food labels, a calorie that they have there with a capital C um, actually is equal to a thousand like laboratory calories, or what we call a kilocalorie. So, you know, when when they say that, you know, on average... Um, you know, the adult human needs 2,000 calories a day in order for the body to function. It's actually 2 million calories a day, but, um, you know, that would, that would be a, a lot to think about. So I think they cut it in, you know, by 1,000 and called it kilocalories instead. So um, anyways, just a little heads up for you. It's actually um, one calorie on the food package would be 1,000 actual chemistry calories that we're talking about. So as we mentioned before, our cells are going to break down the foods that we eat in order to get energy that the cells can use. And the cells use energy that is packaged into a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Now, like we said, it is um, generated in the mitochondria, that's where cellular respiration occurs, and ATP consists of an, an adenosine group 
and three phosphate groups. That's why it's called adenosine triphosphate. And the release of phosphate groups at the end of the molecule here, each time a phosphate's released, it makes energy available for work. So if we take off the first phosphate, we uh, give the cell energy that it can use in order to do work. And then so we get um, what's called ADP as a byproduct, um, which is adenosine diphosphate, since one of those phosphates is now gone. The phosphate that was uh, transferred from the end of the ATP, that was cleaved off the ATP, goes to another cellular molecule and gives it the energy to do whatever kind of work it needs. In fact, there's three types of work that can be done by this other, you know, by the molecules in the cell. Either mechanical work, like um, we see here with the muscle cell, actually moving um, the proteins, the muscle proteins uh, across each other so that the muscles can contract. We can also have transport work, which basically is like the transport proteins we talked about in the plasma membrane cells. So the phosphate there um, gets transferred to the um, transport protein and it gives it the energy to open up the channel so that um, solutes can come in or out of the cell. And then finally, there's the chemical work where uh, a phosphate can be transferred to um, another you know, molecule. That gives it the energy in order to react with another molecule to make a chemical reaction occur and a new product being made. So uh, ATP can be used for mechanical work, transport work, or chemical work. Like I had mentioned on the very first slide about the random facts of energy, um, 10 million ATP molecules are used every second in one muscle cell. So ATP is constantly being used. Um, so luckily, this ATP molecule is you know, recyclable in a sense. It can be generated back by adding a phosphate group back to the ADP. So we get this kind of ATP cycle, which is great because then um, A, our bodies don't have to deal with all this extra added waste of you know, an energy molecule that's you know, already been uh, used up and it can't be regenerated. So um, good thing that ATP can be regenerated. Now, food energy is constantly being used to regenerate ATP uh, through cellular respiration right here. So, um, so when we have energy being let off and ADP is the result, cellular respiration will put that phosphate group back onto um, the ADP so it turns back into ATP and it can go out and do more work for the cell. So this is what we call energy coupling, or kind of like energy recycling, in a sense. In our next lecture, we'll get into more detail about cellular respiration, and now we're just going to jump to um, the concept of enzymes inside of cells. So enzymes are specialized proteins that speed up chemical reactions. So all enzymes are proteins, but not all proteins are enzymes. Um, and these guys have a very special job of helping to speed up chemical reactions. So in our body, we have tons and tons of chemical reactions going on. And the total of all the chemical reactions that occurs inside of our bodies or inside of an organism is what we call metabolism. Okay? Uh, so if somebody says they have a high metabolism, they just have uh, a lot more chemical reactions going on that need energy, than other people who supposedly have lower metabolisms. In any case, um, in these chemical reactions, chemical bonds are being broken and formed. And enzymes are responsible for helping that process take place. Now, in these chemical reactions, um, they require the molecules to absorb a certain amount of heat and that heat energy is what we call activation energy. And this activation energy, um, basically what it does is it kind of supercharges the reactants and triggers them to um, make that chemical reaction occur. Now it would be super dangerous for cells to constantly be heating up and cooling down and heating up and cooling down in order for chemical reactions to occur. So what we have instead 
of constant heating and cooling cycles is we have good old enzymes. Okay, our enzyme friends are the ones who are going to basically lower the activation energy or lower the heat required for the chemical reactions um, in order for them to proceed. All right, so they basically are going to give the energy for the chemical bonds to break. And so what can happen is that these um, chemical reactions are able to occur at lower temperatures and um, it does not, you know, adversely affect our cells and uh, we we get, you know, a constant temperature that we can be, um, our bodies can, can uh, perform at. Now remember, enzymes are proteins and if you remember back to the structure of proteins, they can be highly complex. Remember, they've got the primary uh, sequence of amino acids, which is their primary structure. And then um, that you know long peptide chain is folded, um, kinked or spiraled into the secondary structure, and then you know that's even folded even further in tertiary. And then if we get different protein subgroups, we can have a quaternary structure. So um, you know all of this leads to certain you know sites or certain places within the protein enzyme that reactants can come and bind. And um, a reactant for an enzyme is what we call a substrate. So another name for substrate would be, you know, the reactant of a chemical reaction. And so enzymes bind these substrates at special regions of the molecule, um, specific pockets within the tertiary and quaternary structure. And um, that particular pocket is what we call an active site. So if we look here, you know, at the picture on the right, um, we've got an enzyme here, and we've got little pockets there. Those are um, the the bends and folds within the uh, either the tertiary or quaternary structure of the enzyme, and that's what we call active sites. So the um, the substrate or the reactant is going to kind of fit right in that active site. And um, interestingly enough, enzymes, you know, when they bind that substrate, the um, enzyme can change the shape a little bit just to allow a better fit, a more snug fit. So it's kind of like, you know, you sit in to a really um, comfy couch and it just kind of hugs you, right? It's like you sink right into it and it hugs you and, and you feel nice and, and cozy. That's kind of how a substrate fits into an enzyme active site. So this is what we call induced fit, um, an induced fit enzyme where it kind of just hugs and, and makes the substrate feel nice and comfy within um, that active site of the enzyme. Now once the substrates are nicely fit into the enzyme, the chemical reaction takes place. Um, the enzyme is there to kind of, you know, crack or break that chemical bond in order um, for the chemical reaction to occur. It gives it the energy. And so um, we can say the substrate is converted to products, and those products are then spit out and released. And guess what? That enzyme can, is now free to do the whole process over again. So enzymes, uh, just like ATP, are definitely renewable. So there are times when we want to slow down the you know uh, chemical reaction and the enzymes that are performing you know helping to perform this chemical reaction. So uh, what we use are what are called enzyme inhibitors. In fact, a lot of um, medical drugs are enzyme inhibitors. What they do is that they are um, reactants, or they're basically they're uh, little molecules that are imposters, okay? So they kind of look like the reactants that the enzymes are supposed to be um, helping out in the chemical reaction, but instead of actually, you know, having that chemical reaction take place, they block that active site. They get in there and they sit nice and snugly in the enzyme. The enzyme can't do anything with it, and as a side effect, the, you know, the, the regular substrate can't get into the enzyme. So it slows down the process um, of the enzyme's work and it slows down the chemical reaction. So there's two ways um, that we can have these enzyme inhibitors. Um, one is what we call non-active site inhibition. 
okay, where um, the inhibitor molecule is going to bind to um, a different site on, a, on the enzyme and change the shape of the enzyme so that substrates can't fit. So this is an example of um, a non-active site inhibitor. So we have this inhibitor molecule that fits right in to this little um, site on, on the uh, enzyme. And check it out, it changes the shape of the active site. So see, before the inhibitor, it's a nice open active site. And after the inhibitor, it closes it up a little bit. So that substrate here can't fit in anymore. And so the enzyme can't do its job. Uh, the chemical reaction does not take place. The other type is um, just the, the direct enzyme inhibitors where the uh, inhibitor uh, fits right into the active site itself and blocks any substrates from getting in um, to it as well. So this was kind of a brief little lecture of how cells um, use energy, how they get energy, and how enzymes can help perform chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy needed for those chemical reactions to take place.